you uh, our Healthy Life 2012 as we begin to look at steps where we can make 2012 a healthier year than last year. We look at how can we move towards health and create space for the things in our life that need our attention. Today we're going to look at healthy relationships. Last week, if you weren't here, we looked at ways to have a healthier faith and using the SOAP method. And I want to say again, I'm overwhelmed and pleased of all the ones that have responded about how they're using SOAP and how that's touching their daily life and want to continue and continue that. And if, again, if you want to know more about it, meet me in uh, uh, after worship in the park. But today we're going to focus on healthy relationships. Healthy relationships. And here's the deal. Today, we think, we think we are connected more to others than we ever have been before. We have Facebook. We have Twitter. We have email. We have texting. And these things are not bad within themselves, but they can give off the illusion of relationship that lack depth. Depth, excuse me. And the dangers of our day is that relationally, we can trick ourselves into believing that we're more relationally healthier than we really are. Let me explain this a little further. I like to go to the movies. I didn't necessarily say I like watching movies, but I like going to the movies, and here's, here's why. Because I can watch movies at home. The minute Kelly mentions going to the movie, I begin to dream of a big, huge, buttery thing filled of popcorn that's like 16 bucks. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. And I dream of a, a huge cold drink with that, that perfect ice, you know, it's like hospital ice, with, with, the, with, the, with the straw in it that's like 10 bucks. And then there's those two favorite words I love to hear, free refills. You know what I'm talking about? You know, it's like, hey, get behind the counter, put more butter on it. But that was before this healthy hair lifestyle style thing came, came in. And I can sit, and I can eat, and I can drink for an hour and a half full of pleasure. Doesn't even matter what's going on. And I'm, I'm amazed that, that Will has caught on to this too. Because after the movie is over, after the movie is over, as my belly's sticking out, as I am waddling back to the car, it never fair it fails. Before we even get in the car, Will and I will look at each other and say, what are we going to eat for dinner? You know what I'm talking about. And in which Kelly and Abby yelled out, how in the world can you be hungry? You just ate like a ton of popcorn with five pounds of butter on it. I'm, I'm full on the outside. But I need something more of substance. I need something more nutritional than popcorn and butter and, and diet and cream. I need something nutritional. I need something with value to put inside to satisfy my body. And if we are honest, that is exactly how some of us feel relationally. Full on the outside. Full on the outside. I got 836 Facebook friends. But yet on the inside we crave for something more. And we look around and we see no depth, no substance in our relationship. So how can we move towards healthy relationships? How can we get more substances, substance out of our relationships? If we're going, if we're going to go over some, some ideas and some concepts and biblical concepts, and I'm just going to put some broad strokes out there. I'm going to throw out questions for you this morning that, that I hope that you will write down on, on, on your bulletin or whatever and take it home and begin to think about it. Because the sermon for you and what God has to speak for you will write itself later as you go over the questions. But see, God's desire for us is to move towards healthier relationships in, the, in all areas of our lives. Now, how do we do that? The first thing we need to do 
is we need to focus on the right relationships. What does that mean? Focus on the right relationships. It means simply that all relationships are not created equally. Not everyone who wants to be your friend should be. Not everyone who thinks is your friend really is. And not everyone who is connected to you, who you have even confirmed as your friend, needs equal attention. I'm going to repeat that again because that, that's important. Not everyone who wants to be your friend should be. Not everyone who thinks is your friend truly is, and not everyone who is connected to you needs equal attention. Where did I get this? From the ministry and life of Jesus Christ. If you study the life of Jesus Christ in all the four Gospels, you will see that Jesus did not treat everyone relationally equal. Okay? When it comes to love, when it comes to unconditional love, when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes from the way Jesus treated everyone, absolutely yes. But Jesus loved everyone the same. He treated everyone the same. But when it comes to relationships, Jesus did not have the same relationship with the large, massive crowds as He did with the 72 followers that He sent out to spread the gospel. And Jesus did not interact with those 72 the same way He interacted with 12. And you know what? Even in the 12 disciples, Jesus had an inner circle of three, Peter, James, Peter, James and John, who He considered relationally closer to, to them than the other nine. I mean, not all relationships are created equal. And in order to move forward towards health in our relationships, we must focus on the right relationships. The second thing we must do as we move toward health is focus on family relationships. What are those relationships that we want to focus on? Is we begin with the family. We have to work at, at making family relationships strong. Family relationships are the most important relationships that we have in our life. And it's, and it's ironic that, that intuitively, cognitively, and unanimously, we would all agree that our family, our home relationships are the most important. But we live in a culture that those, pla those places, that those family relationships are under attack. Our culture attacks these relationships more than any other relationships that we have in our life. If, if you were to step out of here and, and sadist, sadistically and evilly wanted to destroy a nation or a group of people or a community, you know, you know how you would do that? You would attack the family. If Satan wanted to attack us, he would attack the family. You would attack marriages. You would attack the, the parent-child relationships. You would attack that grandparent-child relationship. You would erode the family. And experts tell us in sociology, in three generations, you could wipe out an entire culture. Three generations, an entire culture. In our home, if our family isn't strong, nothing else matters. It just doesn't. And some of us here this morning, if we were honest, we have put some relationships on coast a little bit. The problem with coasting, and you're not pedaling, you're not working, the only way to move forward if you're coasting is to go downhill. Think about that. And I want to encourage any of us here, any of us listening over the internet or wherever you're hearing this, if that's you, if you're coasting in your relationships with your children, if you are coasting in your marriage, if you aren't willing to pedal to work hard, then you will be weak. Because for me, the strength of my family is the strength of my life. Think about that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. 
join with me. I've got one verse this morning, and it's, it's a powerful verse. And, and join with me what, what Jesus gives us this concept of. It's so important as we move to our healthy relationship. In the 16th Gospel of Matthew, it's just one verse, and Randy will, will put it on the board. Join with me in your Bibles, if, if you will. Jesus says, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits, yet gives up his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? And what Jesus is, is talking about our souls here, and what he is saying is, is you can have it all. You can have it all. But in order to have it all, you have to give up something. Jesus is talking about a trade here, about an exchange of something. And when you move this, this concept of, of trade and exchange into, into our relationship areas of our life, we have to figure out what we are gaining and what we are losing. If, if I gain a larger audience for my preaching, if I gain a larger budget for this congregation, if I gain more people each each Sunday here in worship, if I gain more notoriety in my ministry, if I gain more people's lives to transform, if I serve Jesus that way and I lose my kids and I lose my, my wife, what have I gained? What have I gained? And I'm learning. I'm learning with my mistakes. I'm learning when it comes to my daughter Abby and my son Will. I am the only one. I am the only one who can be dad. Kelly is the only person that can be mom. And if you're a parent, it doesn't matter how old us kids are. Grab on to this. Hang on to this. But you, because you know why? Because they can get another salesperson. They can get another teacher. They can get another coach. Your kids can get another administrator. This church can get another minister. In every aspect of our life, we are totally 100% replaceable. Oh yeah. Except one. Oh yeah. Except one. We are irreplaceable when it comes to our kids. Irreplaceable. And that's not easy, especially, I'll, I'll throw gender, especially for us men, that's not easy because, because the scoreboard at home is so stinking unclear. Healthy relationships, what in the world does that mean? Because us, us guys, we like to keep score. We, men are scorekeepers, believe it or not. The scoreboard at work is easy. For me, if attendance is up, if, if giving is up, if I'm visiting more people in the hospital, if I'm doing more weddings, doing more funerals, I, all these things can be counted. All these things can be counted. The, there is an increase, I'm winning. The decrease, I'm losing. And if I don't know how to keep score, I've got 150 of y'all that let me know what my score is each and every day in some kind of way. And you remind me of that. But, but how do I transfer that at home? I mean, are my family relationships healthier at home now than they were six months ago? We're playing more we. Does that count? It's hard. I know it's hard. But we've got to engage at home. We've got to tell our children how beautiful they are, how special they are, how much we love them, how proud we are, not only of their accomplishments, of who they are becoming as people. No one can be that voice in our kids' or grandkids' life. It has to come from us. Nobody can tell them, nobody can tell them that which will have more in than we will, than our voice in them. And you know what? If I'm honest in a sobering moment, I don't want anyone else but Kelly and I to be that voice in our children's life. It's just being honest. So how do you do that? I mean, how do we make our family relationships healthier? 
Then I have some questions that I'm going to throw out. I have some, some foolproof ideas. And I'm just going to, going to shoot it at you this morning. And I want you to grab all two of and write it down. First thing, how many nights this year are you going to be around the table looking eye to eye with one another? I mean, do we make meal time a priority or, 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 or a mad dash to, to consume food quickly? True story. Go out to eat here in Centralia, sitting across from us at a table is another minister that serves a church here in Centralia with his wife and his two children. I'm noticing that they're all bowed down. Our food comes as custom in our home. Even when we're out, we, we, we join hands, whoever's around the table, we thank God, God for the food. We, we just do that. Do that, look over, their hands are still down. I'm feeling guilty. I'm like, okay, we didn't pray enough. I mean, this guy's got it going on. He's looking, look, I'm nudging at him. Look at their kids. I mean, uh, you know, hey, look, they're throwing down a huge prayer for God, you know. It's like, look at us. Shame on us. It's like, let's pray some more. What do we do, you know? I look over, they're still down. They bring their food, they're still down. And then we'll notice, Dad, they're not praying. They're all on their phone. And they sat that way for the entire meal. Not one word was said to each other. And this is a great minister. This is a great God, great thing of I mean, man of God. Church is doing good. Right here in our town. They never looked up. You know? I mean, I mean, how often are we going to turn off everything? Our cell phones, the television, the laptop. How often are we going to look at each other eye to eye and say, what happened to you today? What happened in your life today that made you feel successful? What happened today at school that made you frustrated? What happened today that agitated you? What today made you feel strong? And to, to look at your spouse in front of your kids and ask, how was your day, honey? And what it's doing is it's saying that at that very moment there is nothing more important than the relationships around this table. There's no better feeling for me in the world each day when I, when I pick up Will from school and every single day when he jumps in the truck, he always says, So, how was your day? And on a marriage level, what is the rhythm of you as husband and wife team? In life. How much time do you carve out for each other? Do you take time to have uninterrupted conversations? Not about work. Not about the kids. Not about the finances. But talk about your marriage relationship. How many times do you, do you take time to carve out and say, how are we doing as a couple? Let's take the, the temperature of our marriage. How is your heart? Do you set aside time for date night? I mean, there, I know, there are a thousand and one excuses why not to have a date. We don't have any money. Look, if you don't have any money, I got something for you. You want to write this down word for word. One, drop the kids off at the babysitter of the grandparents. They love to see them. Okay, they'll feed them, they'll take care of them, they'll do it. If you don't have that, can't afford a sitter, we live at 14 Edgewood Lane. We love kids, drop them off in our house. No problems. Just call first. Okay? Don't have money. They got this wonderful thing. You don't have to see, see it, but it's called $5 footlong. You with me? For five bucks, if you don't have five dollars, when you drop the kids off, Kelly will give you five dollars. Five dollars, listen to me, I'm serious. Five dollars, two waters, no kids. You have rented a table at Subway forever. You'll walk out smelling like bread, but that's okay. Come on, because it's not about an expensive dinner. You don't have to impress her anymore. You're married to her. She knows you. She knows how much money you have. It's just you make your marital health a priority. And listen to this carefully. Where in your life do you need permission to cheat towards your marriage this year? Okay, if you were dozing off, wake up. I said, I did not say cheat on your marriage. I said cheat towards your marriage. 
I mean, do you need permission to cheat and drop the kids off and get out of town with your spouse for a day or two? Or to cheat and take off work early to cheat towards your marriage to spend time with your spouse? Because your boss, your kids' school, your kids' teachers, your kids' coaches, the basketball league are not thinking about your marriage. They're just not. And if mommy and daddy aren't strong, the family isn't strong. It's that important. When are you, when are you going to engage your kids spiritually? I mean, when do your kids see you reading the Bible and soaping? Do you ever soak with your family? I know that's new, but we've been doing that this week a little bit. I mean, not every day. I mean, it's just what we can. Has your kids seen you pray? Not that God thank you for this new name yet, but I mean to really pray. Hold hands and pray. Has your kids seen you show acts of Christian service? Not attending another meeting at church, but serve someone in the name of Jesus Christ. When do our kids witness us living out the spiritual life that we long for them to have? We've got to put focus on family relationships. We must focus, third, on creating strong relationships. And I know I can't wait much too time on family and, 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 and spouse. That, that's the most important if I had to choose one. If, if we're going to be, be, be healthy, we need to cultivate strong, life-giving relationships. 400 friends on Facebook cannot compare to four really close, strong friendships. Relationships are either life-giving or they're life-draining. A life-giving is that person or friend that lifts you up, that brings out the best in you, that empowers you to be better. Life-draining is that relationship with someone who drains the life out of you, who brings the worst out in you, who weakens you. And if someone's name just came into your mind when I read what life draining is, I hope and pray they're not sitting next to you because that would be awkward. But that's the person you need to not call back so I mean, that's the person that you might not need to spend a lot of time with. That's the person you might be slow to respond to their emails or their Facebook messages or whatever. Because for some of us here this morning, we need permission to lose someone's phone number because they are pulling us away from becoming like Jesus Christ. They are sucking the life out of us. So if that's you and you know someone in your life, get ready and listen. You have permission. Go do it. Simple as that. The fourth is we must focus on finding strong mentors. And some of us in this congregation are mentors, whether we know it or not, to, to, to other people in this congregation. And if, if you're so being, if you take time, if you want to look at what I'm talking about in a biblical sense, the most clearest biblical relationship I can, I can think of as a mentorship uh, is in Timothy. Uh, read First and Second Timothy and hear Paul's words uh, to Timothy. He says, I love you like a son in, in, in one of the verses. It's just, it's just beautiful. And you'll witness this mentorship between Timothy and, and Paul. And Timothy goes on and he, he accomplishes many things because he listens to Paul's advice. We must surround ourselves with these people who have the knowledge, who have the experience, who has the wisdom and the insight to help us out, to, to guide us, to, to keep us accountable. So, so who will you listen to? I mean, who will you read? Who will you learn from? And, and the great thing about soap is some of the greatest mentors in the world are right here in this Bible. Believe it or not. And once you, you start spending every day with them and, and reading, you'll find out that they are our mentor, real life mentors that you can follow. But who will you listen to? Who you will reread? Who will you learn from? We must be intentional about the voices that we hear in our life. So who will you listen to that will make you be a better husband? Who will you listen to that will make you a better wife, a better father, a better mother, a better salesperson, a better teacher, a better leader, and a better follower of Jesus Christ? But surround yourself with these voices. So what does this all mean? And what does this all mean? 
guess it means that for each and every one of us, a choice has to be made. A choice has to be made. I can't make that choice for you. I can only make it for me. But we can either spend another year of our lives settling for, for popcorn, junk food relationships that on the outside make us look full, but on the inside leave us hungry and needing and, and wanting something with substance. Something with nutrition, something that will make us grow and strong and healthy. Or do we do we work hard on working on those relationships? I don't know. I don't know about you, but I, I do know for me that I don't want to spend another year. I don't want to spend another moment, another month, another week, or even another day living and settling on junk food relationships where there's so much substance so close. Let us pray. Gracious and wonderful God, we come to you as your people wanting more substance in our life, wanting those healthy relationships in our family, in our, in our, in our marriage, and in our church, and, and with one another, and with our grandkids. Help us to be that. Help us to be mentors to, to others that are struggling. Help us to find mentors even to do for ourselves. We understand, dear God, that, that some of us go through life filling ourselves up with, with junk food that, that makes us satisfied only for a moment, but doesn't help us grow as, as your children. That doesn't help us be strong when, when the winds and storms of life attack us. That makes us wither away. That we may look good on the outside, but on the inside we're, we're shallow and hungry and wanting more. You provide that for us. Help us to do the hard work. We know, dear God, that it's not easy. We know that it's not easy. We know that we live in a world that runs at a hectic speed and there's so many responsibilities. So many things to do. But help us do the hard work. The right work. Be conscious of those relationships in our life. I pray for each and every one of us, dear God, that we have a healthier relationship with everyone. With you, with our family, with our spouse, and with those in this congregation. That we have healthier relationships in the next year than we had before. Christ,